So welcome everybody. I would say good morning. The problem with noon meetings is uh, it's too late to say good morning and a little too early to say good afternoon. So just good day, everyone. Glad to have you here with us. I am Dr. Keith McCall. I am the Assistant Director of the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards, and uh, I have quite a full house today of uh, staff here to support you uh, in working on your application. So I'm joined by our Director, Dr. Adrian Stevenson, and by our Graduate Assistant, Honorine Royer, who will be uh, managing the recording today. But really, the stars of today's show are Dr. Mendoza, the uh, English for Academic Purposes Coordinator for the in Center for Intensive English Studies, and Dr. Grill, the uh, EAP instructor for the same for CIES as well. So they will be coordinating today's meeting and sharing their screens. Uh, but at any point today, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. There are plenty of us here today to field your questions as they come in or to hold them for um, Q&A sessions. So please feel free at any point that you have a question to go ahead and ask it and we will get to it. That way it doesn't leave your mind before you get around to it. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to today's facilitators who we're very pleased to have with us. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about um, different ways to create cohesion in your writing and cohesion, basically it's like stickiness. It's how do we get ideas to stick together? Also, as I'm speaking, do you guys hear me okay? Everything good. All right, great. So we're talking about stickiness. Sometimes you're going to hear the word flow. How can you get ideas to flow one to the other? So what I'm going to do in my part of the presentation is just show you some actual um, strategies that we use for any kind of writing that you're doing to create cohesion. We get to the second part of the presentation. Dr. Mendoza is going to come in with, um, with an application letter. And then she's going to show you how she would apply some of these strategies within that. So you have something that's more specific to the kind of writing that you might be doing. So ways to create cohesion or stickiness or flow. We've got a bunch of different things that we do. One of the most important things is old to new information flow. So this is how we keep our ideas moving through sentences, through paragraphs, and even through whole papers, through chapters. Um, a lot of times when we ask students, how do you create cohesion, they'll say, oh, well, I can say something like, moreover, furthermore, however, and that's true, but if your ideas aren't sticking together, you can throw all the moreovers in there that you want, and it's still not going to stick, right? So some of those um, connectors, we're going to talk about them, they are important, but one of the other things that's really important is having this old to new information flow. And another thing that happens with that is that topic sentences help to support this. Then we have another thing, which is repetition. And there's a lot of different ways to create repetition. And when I say repetition, I have to be careful with that because I don't just mean repeat everything all the time. Um, you have to have appropriate repetition for it to be successful. So some of the things that we're going to look at are how do I repeat? the same words if they're important, um, different forms of a word, maybe pronouns, and also something that you've probably seen and you might've used in a lot of your writing, the use of this or these plus a summary word or phrase to create some flow. And then of course we do have logical connectors, transition words and phrases. Let's go ahead and get started with this. So I'm gonna try to show you a video and I hope it works here. And um, it's very short, it's like two and a half minutes. I will stop it here and there because there's a couple sentences to read um, and I wanna make sure that you have a chance to read them. All right, let me just play a second of it to make sure you can hear it. The sound isn't on yet. There are three levels of flow. Sentence. Got it, okay. Paragraph and draft. We'll start with the smallest unit, the sentence. Take a look at these examples. Which sentence implies that you'll get the raise you've been hoping for? They already gave you an answer. They're really fast. Let's take a look at these. You deserve a raise, but the budget is tight. The budget is tight, but you deserve a raise. So in our second one, we see that this implies that you're going to get the raise. Makes sense. I know sometimes you got to read it for a second and just think about it. They have another example. Let's take a look at the second example. Or, in which of these sentences makes you think you'll get extra credit in class? Okay, so take a look at that. Which one makes you think 
you will get extra credit in class. First one or second one? I see some second ones here, yes. In both cases, the second sentence is the correct choice because the most important information occurs here in what is called the stress position. Usually, the end of the sentence is emphasized more than the beginning. So, logically, you should put more important and complex information in the stress position, which flows into and defines the beginning or topic of the next sentence. The I just want to say that they're calling this in this video, they're calling it the stress position and the topic position, but this kind of relates to old and new flow. So that when we want something that's kind of new or important information, we tend to put it at the end of sentences. Is it at the end of every sentence? No, but as we're creating flow, we often go from something that people are familiar with or understand into something that is new information that we want to start relating to the known information. So that's what you're seeing here with this. Now, we're only looking at just a couple sentences. And when you do this across paragraphs, then it becomes a little more important because you have a main topic that you're working through. But we have a paragraph that we're going to take a look at. The beginning of the sentence is called the topic position. Now let's talk about paragraph flow. Read these two paragraphs. You can click the pause control to pause the demo. So I'm going to pause it here, give you a chance to look, there's just a little bit in each one that is different, but take a minute to read through them. Okay, need a little more time. There's some unusual language in here that you might not know. Um, so a compact fluorescent bulb is like a light bulb that we have. Um, if I'm looking, actually, I don't have one in the room I'm in right now, but it's the kind of light bulb that we tend to be using. And in the second paragraph here where they, well, no, both the paragraphs are talking about incandescent bulbs. These are like the old fashioned light bulbs that you probably still have in your house, but that most of us grew up with when we were little. And then we switched to these compact fluorescent bulbs. And in those, the old kind of bulb, there's like a little wire in the middle of it. And that is this thing called the tungsten filament. It's this little wire inside that helps to give off the light. So that's what this language is here. Okay, so what are the differences that you see here? You can come off of mute if you want. What are some of the differences between these two paragraphs? I'm looking here in the, the chat. Order of the sentence. Okay, yeah, can you say a little more? Um. Yeah, some, some of them emphasize something at the beginning versus the other one you said at the end. Can you be more specific? <laughs> Such <laughs> as like recess, until recently, most people use incandescent bulbs. Incandescent bulbs. Versus uh -huh. that other one uh, says until recently, most lamps use incandescent bulbs. Like, so the difference there. Exactly. So there, there's a little bit of a different difference there. Let's take a look. They're going to underline some of these differences here for us. Demonstration while you read. Okay, so now... Which flows better? Both paragraphs contain the same information, but this paragraph flows better because it follows the stress position guideline. New information... So do you see how this is happening? You have com compact fluorescent bulb. We get to the end of the sentence, we have household lamps. Until recently, most lamps, I'm, I'm starting to create this old to new flow because now I have, I end with lamps in that first sentence, that's kind of my new information. Until recently, most lamps, now it's, it's going to the old information, used incandescent bulbs. That's my new information. And now I sort of create some repetition, this type of bulb, now it's old information. So I'm constantly going back and forth Kind of repeating and weaving in this idea and adding bits of new information to it as I go. That way my reader can kind of follow with what I have. If I look at the other paragraph here, let me try to scroll back so that it's you can see it a little better. If I look at the first paragraph, as Inga was saying, until recently most people used incandescent bulbs in their lamps. So they had until recently most people instead of most lamps. 
it creates, it's not that I can't understand this. This isn't like a terrible example of breaking up the flow, but it breaks it up a little bit because now I don't have this idea of lamps. I'm going off to this idea of people, but really what I'm talking about are bulbs. So then I have to work a little harder to get back to this idea of bulbs by doing that. So just having some of these small things here with the words that I choose to repeat and by keeping that old to new flow, the flow is a little bit smoother. Both paragraphs contain the same information, but this paragraph flows better because it follows the stress position guideline. New information appears in the stress position before it appears in the topic position in the next sentence. This paragraph also has more closely related topics in the topic position, so it's easy to follow. Keep in mind that ideas in the stress position don't have to become topics in the very next sentence. But no Exactly, yeah, you don't, it doesn't mean that just because you have one topic in one sentence, you must keep it in the next sentence. That's not, that's not true. You might have it two or three sentences later, but you're keeping a connection there. And also sometimes you have to introduce something that's completely new and completely unrelated, and that's possible as well. So sometimes there's a time where we do have to say, okay, I have to stop this flow and now move on to another topic. That works as well too. New topics should appear in the stress position first. And note that all of the flow guidelines presented so far also work for entire papers. Use them to link the paragraphs in your writing. For example, if in your paper the end of paragraph three brings up the eating patterns of tree frogs, then paragraph four should focus on those eating patterns. So, when you're revising, keep in mind the three levels of flow, sentence, paragraph, and draft. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Just a really quick example there. So I wanted to take you into some exercises now so that we could practice some of this, just like on a sentence level basis. So here's a little bit of practice with old to new flow. We've got these two sentences here. Which one do you think has better flow? Now, they're both the same except for one spot. I'll give you a minute to just read through these. All right, so what's the main topic? You can go into chat, you can. Here we are in chat. Habits, bad habits, yes, exactly. Let me see if I can get my thing to work here. Here we go. And which parts of these sentences differ? Can I unmute myself? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, please. So uh, like you previously mentioned on the last slide, um, this one has like um, the A1 focuses more on like the person. So then again, we're drawn back to like people and then it gets kind of hard to like continue reading. Whereas uh, the B uh, paragraph focuses and stays concise into like the idea of the habit. This habit mm -hmm. could be bad, this habit and the location of the habits and why is it so hard to break the habit? So it exactly. stays consistently throughout. Yes. Yeah, so we see this part right here. We've underlined it up here. A person can associate a bad habit. I mean, is this a terrible sentence if you do that? No, it's not. It's not like a horrible thing. But the thing is, if you do something like that, like if you break up that flow a lot in a whole paragraph or in several paragraphs, it becomes harder to follow. You have to stop and go, wait, what? And you have to kind of keep going back and trying to make the connection. So our second one has the better flow in this case because we've got bad habits in the subject position. That's kind of our topic, not person. Person's not the topic of the passage. And then using passive in here allows us to create better flow because we have in the first one, a person can associate, that's the active. And in B we have, in most cases, a bad habit can be associated with. So we're using the passive to just keep that idea of bad habit in that position grammatically. And so the passive works. And I, I just looked back in the, um, in the chat, and I'm sorry I didn't mention this when we were looking at the tungsten filament and the incandescent bulbs. 
a couple people mentioned that as well, that the passive was being used. And sometimes we'll do that because we want to keep something in the old or the new position. And in order to do that, we might have to change the grammar of a sentence to make that happen. So passive voice can be um, a good strategy to use to do that sometimes. Yes, a hand is raised. Yes, uh, Dr. Grill, uh, this is Tulji. Passive voice is the biggest uh, issue I'm facing when I'm doing my assignments, especially. And I do use Grammarly to help me out because English is mm -hmm. my second language. And then I wonder and I think that it doesn't make sense if I change passive voice into something else. It makes more sense when passive voice stays there. Um, I, I am well, so, yeah, struggling no, to find a balance. Yeah, sometimes that's true. So some so um, I think a lot of times, depending on what your field is, you might be told a lot of times, oh, everything should be active. You shouldn't use passive voice. And that's not true. Sometimes you absolutely have to use passive voice. Like if you are in a STEM field and you're writing a method section, a lot of what you're going to be writing is going to be in passive voice because mm -hmm. nobody really cares what the researcher does. They want to know what happened to the the chemicals or to the things, the objects in the experiment. So in some cases, you really want to have passive voice. Um, but you're also not going to need passive voice consistently throughout a document. I mean, there's there's nothing that's going to be written 100% in passive voice. And it would be really hard to read and really boring <laughs> to read too. But Grammarly, Grammarly is used a lot of times for just more like everyday writing. And so if you're putting grammar and Grammarly can be very helpful, don't get me wrong, with academic writing as well. But Grammarly kind of has a bias against passive voice. And it's yep. going to say, don't do passive voice. Uh -huh. So whenever it's so passive voice working. coming up, it's going to tell you don't do that. But you're going to need it in a lot of academic okay. writing just to make the flow better, just to make it more elegant or Simply, it's the thing that's called for for a particular section of a paper. So um, don't be afraid of passive voice. <laughs> okay. Can I add Can something you... here? Um, when, when I first, you know, look at the sentence and, and you said, okay, now we've used passive. And I said, not to mention that we saved a few words. <laughs> and I'm big on like trying to keep the word count down and see if, if we could do yeah. that. But the other thing too, is that if you can use both active and passive, you should use, and it will add variety, you know, to, to the writing. And so, like she said, don't be afraid. <laughs> okay, because it, it makes my nerves down, like, okay, what to do now? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, and yeah, sometimes don't, don't let... also, I will say, we are looking at this little excerpt out of context. I will mm. say that for everything else that we are doing, you know, later and all the other examples. And maybe you've already used passive a lot. So when that word processor highlights your passive, it's a good thing to notice that maybe you've overused it, you know. Um, and, and sometimes you would say, no, I want to change that because I don't want it to look like the previous sentence or like the next sentence. Okay. Right. Right? So that's another factor to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Great. Well, let's move on with a couple more things. So we have this idea of old to new flow. Re this is a really super important idea for creating um, flow and cohesion. I would say this is the number one thing, because if you understand, basically, if you understand where you're going with your topic, then you can use that old to new flow to kind of build up. It's like you're, you're teaching your reader, you're leading them, especially in academic writing, you're leading them through your academic story that you're trying to tell them by bringing, gradually bringing the new things in and creating those connections um, among all of these different topics that you have so that it's clear to the reader. A lot of times what happens for us as readers is that it's clear in our heads. We have the conversation in our heads. And then when we go to write things, we leave 50% of it in our heads and not on the paper. So when the reader is reading, they're like, I'm not following it. And you're like, it's totally clear. It is clear in your head. <laughs> it's just not on paper. And sometimes it's helpful to have somebody else point that out to you because you say, oh, I'm not giving you enough examples. I'm not creating some clarity there. Then you can go in and start adding that. So the other thing to remember with this is as we're showing you these strategies, the idea is not like use these strategies and you'll never have a problem again. 
<laughs> that is not true. You still need other people to look at your work. You still need to put it aside, come back to it the next day and revise it and maybe revise it three, four, five, six times till you get it because you might have to look at it several times and go, oh, I'm missing the old to new flow. Oh, I could have some successful repetition here. Oh, I could, you know, use a couple of transition words to help me. And it can take time to get there for everybody, <laughs> for, for native speakers and non-native speakers alike. Okay, so let me move to the next slide here. So a little bit more on repetition. There's a lot of different ways to create effective repetition. Um, sometimes it's most effective and it's easy to just repeat the same word or phrase. Be careful with this, though, because sometimes you'll hear your professors say, oh, you're being too wordy. You're repeating yourself all the time. Now, ineffective repetition is when you don't go anywhere with it. You're just saying you're in a circle. You're in a loop. You're just saying the same thing again and again. You're not moving to the new position in a sentence. You just keep repeating the old thing again and again. That is not helpful because then I never see where your argument is going. I keep going back, right? Um, but effective repetition is something where I can repeat an idea and bring in new ideas and kind of circle through a paragraph or a paper where I keep moving to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Okay, next point here is that sometimes it's most effective to repeat the same word or phrase, and sometimes you can create more elegance by using different parts of speech. So we're just gonna practice with this a little bit to show you what this could be like. So we've got the root like analysis, and we have a lot of different words that we can build off of that. We have nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and this first one is done for us. So we see like our noun would be analysis, our verb, analyze, or even something like reanalyze. Adjective could be analytical, adverb, analytically, right? So depending on what we're trying to say, it might make sense to use a different form of the same word. So now with number two, what do we have as a noun in number two? So this is where we have insignificant, significance, significant. I'm looking in the chat here. There we go, I see significance. I'm trying to get my PowerPoint to work here. There we go, very good. For the verb, you can come off of mute. It'll take me longer to read in the chat <laughs> and open it up. <laughs> what are our verbs? Okay. Y'all are still going to the to the chat. All right. Yeah, somebody says signify. <laughs> I'll help you Here with the go. chat if you want. Okay, to. thanks. Yeah, because every time I click on the chat, I can't <laughs> forward. <laughs> I can't forward my slide. Yeah. Okay. The adjective. Significant? Yep, significant. Or we even have the antonym, right? The opposite, insignificant. And then our adverb, that one's pretty clear, significant, significantly. I can't even say that. That's hard. <laughs> All right. The last one here with invalid, invalidate, valid. What is our noun? In some cases, you might have two. Notice like we have up with analyze, analyze, and reanalyze, insignificant, significant. So what do we have for the noun here? Validity and validation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Validity, validation, and the verb? Validate. Ah. Yes. And invalidate. Mm -hmm. And then the adjective? Invalid, valid. Yes. And then our adverb is validly, which is kind of an interesting one. Hmm. I've never really heard validly, but I was looking this up. Um, this was an exercise from a textbook. I thought it's got to be a real adverb. <laughs> They're not just going to throw it in here. Actually, in, um, in the law, if you're doing legal writing, validly is a word that you might use. Oh, wow. You learn something new every day. And again, um, I'm just pointing out like the, the repetition has to be appropriate and effective. So just using repetition for the sake of repetition does not move you from old to new. But if you do it with that intention, then you can use it as a successful um, 
strategy. So now the next two slides, we've got two short paragraphs here and we're going to look at how we can do use some of this repetition. I'm gonna read through this and show you how this works. And then you guys will be able to jump in and tell me what words we need. So these two paragraphs here, According to Jared Diamond, this is a, a man, he's a writer, many new inventions are never adopted by society. Now we see adopted up here and it says number four. So that means later on, we're going to repeat some form of adopted, right? And we'll have to think, how do we want to do that? So we'll get to the next slide and we'll see it. Diamond notes that while many inventions are more efficient than older technologies, blank is not always the main factor in embracing a new technology. So now what I want here in this blank is I want some, some form of efficient. Maybe it's the same word, maybe it's another word. What do you think it might be? Efficiency? Yes. Efficiency is not always the main factor in embracing a new technology. Often a society has economic reasons for holding on to an older technology and thus rejects the new one. For example, the blank of electric lighting in England can be traced to massive investments in gas lighting. Adoption. So for this one, we're with number two. So uh -huh. we've got reject. So that's the word that we're working oh, rejection. with. Rejection. Uh, yes. No, maybe. <laughs> right? Yeah. That was a guess, so have, guesswork. Yeah, okay. so like often a society has economic reasons and they reject the new one, for example. So here we've got one of our transition words being mm -hmm. successfully used, for example, the rejection of electric lighting in England. Okay. Right, so we've got, we've got this repetition of the word. Then we have another example. In addition, some ancient Mexican societies uh, never adopted the wheel for transportation as they were not able to use animals to pull wheeled vehicles. This blank, and now we, this is a tricky one because we have were not able. So it's like we're trying to say, can't be able to do something. This blank to use an animals. Enabled? In a, in inability. Enabled? Yes. Inability. inability. Yes. This inability to use animals rendered wheeled vehicles useless. And that's also an interesting word. To render something useless. It's just it made them useless. Okay. Everything clear here so far? Yep. Thank you. Good. All right. So we have one more paragraph with this. Now we have adopt, right, up here at the four. So number four, our word was adopted. Another factor affecting the blank of new technologies is resistance to change. So what would I put in number four in that space? Adoption, adoption of new technology. Mm -hmm. Another factor affecting the adoption of new technology. So you see, we're also repeating the idea. So we've had this idea of, adopting new technologies. And now we're repeating that idea and we're gonna go further into it. So this is that old to new flow that's happening as well. Mm -hmm. So now we have number five, resistance and change. In the 1930s, typists blank the introduction of a new, more efficient typewriter keyboard, given that typists were used to the old keyboard and did not want to blank their habits. Resistance, same word? So what what do we have yeah in number five in the 1930s typists resisted, resisted right uh -huh. so I had resistance I have a noun here and now I have resisted the verb hmm. okay. and when I get to the end of the sentence they were used to the old keyboard and did not want to adopt new yeah. their so take a look change. at numbers change, change. Yeah. Yeah, now for this oh, one here, sorry. Sorry. so change, yeah. yeah, this exercise is having us look at, at the word they're giving us, but for number six, I added some other ones, because you don't oh. have to do that, it doesn't have to be the same word, right, oh, so okay. you could change it, modify their habits, alter their habits, it could be a synonym, it doesn't have to be exactly the same thing. Okay, a couple more. Often a new item is adopted or rejected based not on its use or economic value, but on its social value. So we have the word value. One such example is expensive designer jeans, which are more highly blank than generic, cheaper generic jeans. And we have our word value. What might I use for- Valuable. Are more highly, actually are more highly valued yeah, but you could use valuable. 
you could say um, which are considered more valuable, right? You might just have to change some of the wording, but you you still have the repetition and you're using that word in a different form. So that works. Another example is the preference of Japan's kanji writing system over the kana system. Many people blank um, using kanji, even though it is a quite difficult system because it holds social prestige. Preferred? Prefer using kanji. So oh. here we see how this repetition is helping us go through. And the repetition is appropriate. It's not wordy. It's just keep helping us keep our idea flowing. All right, let's do a little more practice with this. So another thing that we do with repetition is we'll often use this plus these with a summary word or phrase. You can use the word this in different ways. Like sometimes this just, it's a determiner. Like in this study, we present the results of an experiment. That is not the same thing as this plus a summary phrase. Uh, may I request, sorry to interrupt. Can sure. we quickly go on the previous slide because I was going to take a screenshot of it. Is it possible? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate it. That's it. Thank you. We should have a copy of, of this. Like you'll have you'll have the, oh. the PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I'll share that with you. Yeah. So here we've got this and these plus a summary word or phrase. So another way that we create repetition is sometimes we'll use this if we have a singular or these if we have a plural. And then we'll have some kind of a, a summarizing word or phrase. And that's another way that we can create this old to new pattern. So for example, many countries have laws that require children to get some kind of education. These laws differ in the number of years education is mandatory. So I'm repeating the word laws, but I might have something like this. Nowadays, laptops are lighter and more powerful than they were five years ago. These improvements. So now I have this idea that I'm repeating. And you've probably seen this a lot in articles that you've read and you might use it as well. So we're gonna practice with this here. So I have got some sentences, we have a blank and using the following constructions, this plus a singular noun or these plus a plural noun, look at the um, underlined word in the sentence. We're gonna to try to just repeat what we have in the sentence for now, for, the, for a couple of examples. The company mistakenly published confidential client information on their website, this, may lead to identity theft and credit rating problems. This what? I'm checking the chat. Mistake? Yes, this mistake. Okay, here's another one. I'll give you a second to read these. Scientists warn about the dangers caused by pollution. And we see that our word here is warn. However, some people believe that because blank are not covered enough by the media, they go unheeded. So first I have to figure out what word am I repeating? And then I have to think, do I need this or do I need these? Anybody? These warnings? Yes, these warnings. Here's another one. Some people assume that children are not reading enough and are becoming bad writers because of the increased use of the internet. According to recent studies, this or these mm, have been proven false. Assumptions. Yes, and then do I need this or these? These assumptions. Yes, because it's plural, right? So Correct. I've got that. So that's how, that's just kind of the grammar of how this works. Now, when you're really writing, though, you, you're not always going to just repeat it like that. You might use other words. So let's take a look at these. This time we're, we've got a this, and we're going to decide what word or phrase that we want to use here. And there's a lot of different options. So let me read this first one. Irrigation in many developing regions is often performed by using a rope and bucket at clear irrigation. Like it's just getting water. Like if you're a farmer and you need to get water to your plants, you need an irrigation system. So they'll use a rope and a bucket to raise and distribute water from a shallow open well. While this blank has the advantage of being inexpensive, it's low capacity and labor intensive nature is decidedly a disadvantage. 
what could you use there? Well, this, and there's many different words or even like short phrases that might work there. Any ideas? System development. That could work. System um, development. I'm checking the chat here. Habit. System. Yes. Here's some ideas, method, approach, technique, simple technology, right? So there's a bunch of different things that you could say that would work here. Let's do one more. Haney concludes from his study that driving performance decreases when drivers use their cell phones. This blank is consistent with recent reviews of the literature on driving distractions. This habit, this conclusion. Okay. I would say habits. Um, well, yeah, you might be able to use habit there. Conclusion. This finding, this outcome is consistent with recent reviews of the literature. Good. So you don't have to just use the same, like the idea can be repeated, right? That's another way to create this. Now, I think at this point, we are moving on to Dr. Mendoza's portion of the presentation. Okay. So, um, all the uh, ideas that Dr. Grill has discussed so far about creating flow, maybe uh, from one sentence to the next, right? Um, the traditional way maybe to think about is just by using connectors or transitions. In fact, sometimes you feel like you need to start a new sentence, you need a new transition. What are you going to use, right? Um, and that's not always the case. So, I on the next slide, I have a we have a table here from our textbook. This is a textbook we use. I'm actually going to show it to you in our um, in our writing class is um, academic writing for graduate students, Wales and Feek. And some of the exercises that you saw are in the first chapter of that book. Very useful. So some of the things that we've included so far. So if we think about it in in you know, maybe the traditional way we're looking at sentence connectors, which will be in the middle column here, like hover and contrast um, on the contrary. So you have different ideas there. I really like this table because I like to go back to it with my students sometimes and think of what other transitions could work in, in that same sentence. And if we, if we look um, across, all of these will have the same punctuation. That means they are sentence connectors. You have a period before, you have a comma after your transition, and then the next sentence. But if we look over here, we're looking at class connectors. So that means there will be two parts of the sentence, two subjects, two verbs, and they're somehow connected. The punctuation will depend on whether, you know, the the word is at the beginning of the sentence or in the middle. So if I use although at the beginning of the sentence, somewhere in the middle of the sentence, I'm going to have to have a comma and then the subject verb of the other clause. Um, but if I put it in the middle, then there's no comma. For example, if I say, because I woke up late, comma, I missed my first class, right? But I could swap it and say, I missed my first class because I woke up late. There's no comma there, right? So, um, and, you know, there's imp important implications here with punctuation, like I just mentioned, um, but also sentence structure and the next level that I like to think about is sentence variety. So am I using a variety of transitions? Uh, am I using a variety of ways of creating flow or am I over relying on my transitions to create flow? Like Dr. Grill said earlier, just because you put more over <laughs> or as a result, does that mean you've created flow? Okay. So um, I, I didn't want to say too much about this part uh, as long as, you know, we all kind of, I think we all are aware and, and use all of them. But what we need to think though is, and I'm going to show my next uh, slide here, but, is that we use these in conjunction with other ways of creating flow. So if you look at this paragraph here, um, we are looking at two transitions, number two, so the beginning of sentence number two, and the beginning of sentence number three. Then we're, we have our class connectors, while and but, 
But we also see these variations and this value. And we also see old to new information flow. So for example, workers are mentioned at the end of the first sentence and workers are mentioned at the beginning of the second sentence, right? Um, uh, the sentence number two ends with nations. In the next few sentences, I see the, the names of different countries, United States, Iceland, Mexico. So there's a variety of ways of creating flow. And this little example here kind of shows us where we're going. In fact, I want us to look at, for example, sentence number seven. This is according to, there's four dimensions, power distance or certainty avoidance, individualism, masculinity. And sentence number eight starts with power distance, okay? And explains, right? I can predict that the next sentence will be about uncertainty avoidance or the next paragraph or, you know, because I, there is a linear pattern and I've been, I'm being introduced to four different ideas and they are going to show up in that order. Okay. In that sense, the reader doesn't have to make a huge effort to figure out <laughs> what your intention is. It's not like a surprise that's going to reveal itself at the end of the paragraph. No, everything is clearly stated and it follows a pattern, a li linear pattern. Okay. So um, we could spend a little more time on this, but I'd rather um, look at one sample. Okay. And, and when you look at this, um, probably look at this example later when you get the PowerPoint, you can do a little more analysis and maybe find the words that are repeated and, and things like that. I'll, for example, we have tips and tipped and tipping and tipping costumes and tipping norms. So you can think about the synonyms like we were just thinking in the examples that Dr. Grill did. Okay, there's a lot here, but at this point, I want us to try to see if we can put these ideas together in trying to edit or revise a piece of writing. So Honorine, thank you, was kind enough <laughs> to share a, some of her writing for her application. I don't know if you want to say a little bit about this application, but I have picked a paragraph here that describes her work, okay? Honorine? Do you? Sure. Yeah, I can. Um, so I, I mean, I applied to many different ones last year. Um, so I'm not sure which which one you picked, but I see that you, you talk about the, you picked a paragraph about my work, which I kind of used in every application. Uh, but I was mainly applying to um, like dissertation um, fellowships, which means that I wouldn't have to work. Um, I would have been able to just focus on writing. Um, I didn't get them because I'm here, <laughs> um, but it was a great exercise and I really improved uh, on my writing. Um, and um, I suppose you took an early draft, right? Yes. So I took an early draft and, and this is, I will, I will say a couple of things. I've said uh, earlier, I said we were looking at things out of context and this is important. Please keep it in mind <laughs> because any revision that I do here, you know, could affect the previous paragraph, the, the following paragraph could look too much like the next one. And I don't want to do that, you know. So we're just considering this little paragraph, you know, sort of out of context. The other thing is we, um, you know, we when we first write uh, our first draft, uh, we just were worried about the content, right? And we want to make sure all the ideas are in there that we want to say, right? And um, once we start revising, some things can become unimportant or some things can, uh, can seem like, oh, this is not so clear, get a little bit obscure. I need to explain more about that. I need to expand here or there. And so we would be making you know, other changes to content as well as to grammar, sentence structure. And in this one, we're particularly focused on flow. Okay. Now, I did not consult with Honorine about what she meant or what she wanted to do. I just I have some assumptions here, and I'm going to work with those. And I want to, um, I, I, I really want you to, to um, uh, understand we are focused on flow here, but we might be making some changes. For example, I'm trying to add something 
at the beginning of a sentence that makes my sentence much longer. Do I want to do that? You know, so we will try to think and evaluate. And what I have decided to do is we're, we're going to read this, but I, I picked sentence one and two and see if we can make them more cohesive and then two and three and three and four, you know, um, and then I'll show you sort of the, the whole paragraph with some changes to see, you know, what you think and honoring maybe you can uh, you jump in there and to see if I've captured um, kind of what I you were trying to do. And um, of course, this is not my field and I don't understand exactly what she is doing. So please forgive me if I'm like, <laughs> didn't understand, you know, something. Um, I also realized that some of what she's writing or doing is may not be, you know, exactly how you write in your field, right? So, but all of us are trying to understand a little bit more about flow and cohesion here and how to make it work, okay? So um, I guess we can read it um, together and see where we, you know, what we can find what for, to create some more cohesion. In my work, I decode those tensions between France and Algeria, and I bring new voices, often silenced, to the ongoing discussion. I demonstrate the ways in which graphic narrative authors who are not from academia intervene in historical debate regarding French national identity, providing the missing perspectives of many silenced actors of the Algerian war. While each text of my corpus is set differently in the personal trauma they depict, I argue that each insists on the way of innovative textual practices. For instance, the reader is constantly made aware of the images as representations and not objective truth. The bimodal form of graphic narratives allow authors to make a social intervention into mainstream representation of the war, which favored statecraft narratives influencing French society and culture. And I believe there were a couple more sentences here. So I actually cut them off so we could kind of focus here. So this is not the full paragraph, um, but we're going to work with this one. Um, I also want to add that if you see this, um, the piece you already have, you have, for instance, here, you have while here. So we have a couple of our connectors that we saw in our table, right, in the previous one and and then we can decide you know if we want to keep them or changing and, and sometimes it will depend again what we do to the previous sentence or to the next sentence okay uh was there something was there a question in the chat or okay <laughs> all right okay so let's look at sentence one and two so Keeping in mind what we have discussed so far, can anybody think of a way that we could create a better connection between one and two? And of course, more than one answer is correct. There's a hundred different ways that you can say this, right? So, but. <clears throat> Maybe I can go first. People are maybe too afraid to criticize my <laughs> sentences, which is totally fine. Feel free to criticize. Um, but I feel like because I use the word voices, um, and then I say author, maybe I could mm -hmm. use the same word so that um, you know I keep the flow and uh, mm -hmm. that's create a, a stronger connection there. Okay. Um, and so if I started the sentence with like these new authors or something like that that my the sentence number two that might create a stronger connection there okay that's a possibility what else do you see here so let's look at the grammatical subjects of both of these sentences i have i decode i sorry but for decode and then i demonstrate so what you're trying to do here is to tell me what your work is trying to do right the goals or so how is sentence one if if I think about it that way how is sentence one and sentence two connected how what's the connection what I think that I was trying to make a connection with you know, I bring new voices and those mm -hmm. new 
voices or the graphic narrative authors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you could, oh, so you could actually use, you just saw it different. It's great that you're here because you saw it a little different than I saw it. So I, I, I saw as you trying to tell me my work is trying to do this plus that, right? Like I have two goals with my work, right? Um, and, you know, maybe that's not exactly what you were trying to do, but I think the whole paragraph is trying to tell us what your work wants to accomplish, right? Um, so if I change the second sentence to, um, you know, these new voices include graphic narrative authors, right? And I put that at the beginning of sentence two, maybe then, um, you know, that explains and connects a little better, right? Um, and, and we probably should write something like that. Let me, let me see. Um, let me use the chat here. So for example, um, these new voices are, what did you call them in the second? Graphic narrative. Okay, effort, uh, authors, right? Graphic narrative authors da, 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 da. and i have created a new subject to the sentence that connects to the last part of my previous sentence that would make nice flow there okay um there is also um the the another part and in this case we might need to revise the sentence that create a new sentence where it says providing missing perspective of many silence actors da, 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 da. so maybe um could be a new sentence here, right? Uh, that says, you know, my aim is to provide the missing blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's a possibility. Okay. So when I first looked at it, like I said, I saw maybe, oh, we can create like another a connector here that says, um, I, you know, my work, I decode. And in addition, for example, I demonstrate ways. Okay. Uh, and if I look at my table, I may look at in addition and see if there's other options like also or um, additionally or something like that. So maybe a nice transition here could create more cohesion there. Okay. I have a question about that. Um, mm -hmm. So in the past, I, I used to use like a lot of connectors. Um, and then one of my professor was like, you know, it's taking space. And as you said earlier, mm -hmm. that's the less words, the better. Mm -hmm. So I always struggle with, um, you know, when is when is it a good time to use connector? Mm -hmm. When is it not necessary? Mm -hmm. Is this just an addition to, mm -hmm. because especially when we write fellowship application, we're so short on, on words. Yes. On words. So if you see this example here, there's only two you know, in nine sentences, there's for example, and um, however, you know, um, so there, there aren't a lot and we, it, and maybe your professor was right, maybe you're overusing them as like, you think, oh, okay, I'm going to start a new sentence. So I hear, here, I need a new transition here, but maybe you don't, there's other ways to create flow. Okay. So, and, and when is it necessary? So this kind of, I, I'm kind of working backwards here. <laughs> Because at the end, I actually want to talk about topic sentences. Um, but <laughs> um, it makes sense if at the beginning of the sentence, I say, I am going to give you some reasons for something. And then reason number one, reason number two, reason number three, right? And I may connect that. Or if I say, um, you know, my, my work uh, seeks to accomplish, you know, several goals and first, second, you know, but I'm not going to use for a second, but I am going to list, right? Um, and so it makes sense to connect them if it adds. Um, and for example, is a good one. I mean, like if you're providing an example and you are in your paragraph, there's, you know, you can use for example or for instance, right? But can you use something else? Yeah, maybe you can say one example, okay, is this and that, right? Um, but yeah, so try to not over rely on, on transitions, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but 
use them if it makes sense to try to show a point. Um, so if you're if we're using contrast, right, and we want to show that from the beginning, you know, and uh, if it contrasts with the previous paragraph, right, the information presented in the previous paragraph, right, you might need it, right? There's no way to avoid it. Yeah, and um, regarding the, the, the question of uh, word counts and all of that, I think I always try to go for, you know, fewer words. I, I always, and, and somebody mentioned in the chat, they struggle with long sentences, right? Um, how do we make them more concise? And sometimes that is a, a very important question that, you know, we want to address and we want to make changes based on that. Also, nobody writes long sentence after long sentence after long sentence. We tend to communicate, you know, in a variety. We'll have shorter, longer sentences combined. Okay, so, all right, let's move on so we can look at two and three. So, um, and notice I didn't change anything here. I'm just looking at the sentences for what they are. So I have, um, I demonstrate ways, da da da, and then three starts with while each of the text and the corpus is set differently in the personal trauma, blah, blah, blah. I argue, da da da. What's the connection here? <clears throat> so here the connection was the corpus mm -hmm. graphic narrative mm -hmm. okay but this seems to be new information right so i use i in French, we don't like repetition. <laughs> I don't say graphic narratives again. I use corpus. Uh huh. <laughs> so, but it feels like it's new information, right? So sometimes just the fact that I read all the beginning, all the subjects, let's say in the in the sentence, and they are new subjects, um, the, it feels like there's they're a little disconnected. The sentences may feel like a little disconnected. So, um, so if I um, if I'm going to refer to something that I um, mentioned before, then maybe it should be this corpus or, um, but but actually I, I'm not sure that it's clear from, you know, the, that this graphic narrative authors turns into corpus, <laughs> you know, that is super clear, you know, that, that that's the connection there, okay? So, so by having a new subject here, and some senses might have a, something completely new, but by having a new subject, then maybe I am like introducing a new idea and the, the reader may be a little bit lost. Um, I also uh, feel like as I kept reading, when I see in the previous one, um, and in this one, I demonstrate and I argue, you know, with, with the first person that the researcher, the author is trying to explain their work. Um, I feel like you have a lot of the sort of the same sentence structure. Um, in here, it's changed to the to the second position because you've actually used the class uh, connector. So I think, you know, the the idea gets lost that you are trying to tell us what you're trying to accomplish in your work, okay? Um, and we would need maybe a stronger organization to, to show us that, right? And I'm gonna get to that. I said I, I'm working backwards because I'm looking at sentence level stuff and then I will look at the whole paragraph again. So, um, so if it seems like sentence two and three are a little disconnected, okay? then maybe I need a whole new sentence here. Like for example, um, you could describe your corpus, right? Like you could say, um, I've included this graphic narratives or however many graphic narratives for analysis in a corpus. And then the next sentence would say, while well, each 
text in the corpus, blah, 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 then everything will be really connected. So here I would suggest actually a whole new sentence to be added, which is kind of scary because it's like, ooh, what, are, what is that going to do to my word count? <laughs> okay, next. So I'm looking at three and four now, and four starts with, for instance, the reader is constantly made aware of the images of representation. So I think this actually is an effective use of a transition there, uh, because you're telling me, you know, about innovation, and here's one example, okay, of innovation. So I think that is definitely, that works there. But if I wanted to do something a little different, okay, I could use <laughs> one of these innovations is the way in which the reader is constantly made aware of blah, 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 blah. So I am now using these plus the plural noun as a summary phrase for something I mentioned in the previous sentence and, um, you know, using a different kind of connector. Now, if you didn't use, for instance, in the previous paragraph or the next paragraph, maybe you don't want to change it. It's fine. Okay. So again, looking at things out of context. Okay. Let's look at four and five. So, Onarine, how are four and five connected? So, we went from one example of the previous of the innovations now. Yeah, so <laughs> here I'm kind of like repeating myself again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's, um, I guess it's three and five that are connected. Mm -hmm. four, is an four is an example of three. Yeah. And right? Then, um the bimodal allows uh -huh. uh, and then it's kind of like what yeah the, that's the con five is kind of like the consequences mm -hmm. so so i i probably would want something else at the beginning of this sentence to show me i'm moving from you know i said let's say i said sentence number three and here's an example that, to illustrate three and now i'm going back to my other point <laughs> kind of right um, so this is the one where I struggle the most because, of course, this is also not my work. So I'm like, how do I change this? Um, and, and, and I don't know if I've changed, but it seems like a new topic. So is it another innovation? Is it another point that I want to accomplish? And so my mind kept going back to what you were trying to tell us. I decode, I demonstrate, I argue. And is this something new that you're trying to show with your work? So... <laughs> I changed that to something that makes the sentence very long and does not make me happy, right? But I wanted to put it in here so that we can go back to kind of the point that I was making before I gave you an example, right? Um, and so another goal, my work seeks to accomplish to show the bimodal blah, 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 blah. And I made one more change here um, using thus, thus influencing French society, because I think this neck, this last part, and we can spend a lot of time on the grammar here, and I don't really want to, but, um, I think this part influencing French society and culture refers to, does it refer to the graphic narratives or to the, uh, mainstream representation? Actually, it's the fact that the state um, craft like favors some mm -hmm. narratives and mm -hmm. because it's the state, it's like the, the country's narratives. Then mm -hmm. it's uh, so if, it, if this refers to the con to the mainstream representation of the war, which favors state crafted narratives mm -hmm. to influence French society and culture, okay. I think would be the best. Now, if if we um, are going to talk about maybe uh, the new narratives or the graphic narratives, then maybe this will work. Okay. But I, I had a like a little grammar confusion here because I wasn't sure what this last part referred to. And that happens sometimes when we make such long sentences, we, we, we can add more, but sometimes it's not clear what it refers to in the text. Okay.
Okay. So that also didn't make me happy, like I said, because it, it, it made the sentence much longer, but then maybe I could just say my work also shows the bimodal form of graphic narrative allows authors da 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 da. So I think you can kind of get the hint of where I'm getting at here is that in order for me to actually create the flow in a more effective way, I need to think about what this paragraph wants to do. Okay, what I as a writer want to accomplish with this paragraph. So I actually, um, you know, would say, oh, okay, I, I think if I add a sentence here, if I add a connector here, if I use this plus summary phrase, you know, maybe I can add finally here because I'm looking at all the things that this work tries to accomplish. And this is sort, sort of that goal at the end there. Maybe that will make it better, right? Um, but <laughs> um, I am still missing something, okay? I cannot effectively do that if I don't know what I'm trying to do. So what do I want to accomplish? What is my point? Well, in this paragraph, I want to explain what my work is trying to do, okay? And so maybe all the different goals. Or maybe in this paragraph, I'm trying to explain why this work is relevant. Reason number one, reason number two, reason number three. Or in this paragraph, I'm trying to explain uh, two different approaches, right? And, you know, um, which one is better? Or maybe I'm trying to explain one approach and it has advantages and disadvantages, okay? So that should come before any editing. <laughs> Because I actually took you to look at sentence number one and sentence number two, how are they connected? Sentence number two and three, how are they connected? But there's, it's hard. I mean, I'm not doing so much good <laughs> if I am just trying to connect sentences to one another, if I'm not thinking big picture, okay? I have to think of the whole paragraph. So big most important question, do I have a topic sentence at the beginning of the paragraph? The first sentence should indicate what this paragraph is about, okay? And that should help me organize my paragraph. So some of the examples that I said. So if I want to tell you with my paragraph why this work is important, then I will organize it around reasons, right? And I'm not going to say first, second, third. I, I can use a variety of ways to express that and create cohesion, but I need to think of the whole organization. Okay. So creating flow from one sentence to the next, you know, it's it's kind of the last level, right? So I worked on that to kind of demonstrate what we were trying to think about with all the examples that Dr. Grill walked us through. But <laughs> the bigger picture is more important, okay? So we have to think about that. So if I determine that, and maybe I'm wrong, right? <laughs> but that this paragraph, Honorine is trying to tell us what her work is trying to accomplish, then maybe if I have a topic sentence here at the beginning, right? And this is not perfect or anything. I'm just, it, I'm using it to demonstrate, okay? Um, maybe I will have an easier, <laughs> my work easier for myself because I, ha I know I have a goal, I have an objective, this is what this paragraph wants to accomplish, so then I can more easily create that flow, okay? So, um, so if I use several major tasks, so my work seeks to accomplish several major tasks, so first of all, I want to do this, and bring you voices and demonstrate. And then I argue. And then finally, you know, my work also indicates. So now I have a more cohesive paragraph. Um, I've connected in, in a couple of different ways. And, but I have, the most important is I have that sentence at the beginning that tells me what the rest of the paragraph is about, okay? Remember, the reader does not have to guess. <laughs> It's not going to come as a surprise. It's not creative writing. It is academic writing. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, and here it is, and here's an example, and take the reader by the hand, okay, kind of thing. 
okay? So I did one more revision and then I'll, I'll check the chat and, and open it up for questions because maybe some of you in your field may not write like this and may not write in first person, right? Depending what your field is. And so here I use more passive. Where's my friend that was asking about passive? She's still in the call. <laughs> um, so, so maybe I would say something like the present study seeks to accomplish several major tasks. And so something, you know, the, those tensions are decoded. There's a detailed analysis of the ways da da da. And then, you know, um, I, I try to write it in a little more impersonal way and, you know, revise for just to, to show you that if that's not typical of your field to write in the first person as Honorine did in her application, then um, that is also possible, okay? All right, I think that's it. I think I will stop talking here <laughs> and open it up for questions and comments.